My mom used to drive me crazy. She was so generous. She was so gracious. Why couldn't she be a little tougher? Why did she give away so much of her, her resources, her time, her energy, her attention? Felt like she was giving away my stuff to other people. Oh, mom, I wanted to protect my interests. Keep it for me. Demand it for myself. I have my share of selfishness, but selfishly demanding my own way, I have slowly learned over the years, may fail to serve the kingdom of God. My mom saw a much more complex reality than I did. She may have been losing on one plane, but she was, she was winning on another plane. Paul saw his world on more than one plane. He battled people who proclaimed Christ for selfish gain and ambition. We learn about that in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he wrote affectionately to these Philippian people, this church that had conflicts within it. And he talks about their murmuring and their arguing within their fellowship in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he talks about bitter arguments they're having about the law and about <laughs> circumcision. In chapter 4, he mentions these two important women, Yodia and Syntyche, who were at serious odds with each other. So there was that level of tension. But Paul saw them also on a completely other plane. And he gives joyful thanks to them. He gives thanks for them. He says, every time I think of you, I thank my God. So back to my mom. This year, I learned a story from my mom I'd never heard before. The story goes like this. It was 1942, the first week of April. It was Holy Week that year. It was five months after Pearl Harbor. On Easter weekend, her father drove the family from their Harbor City farm, near the LA Harbor, to the Santa Anita racetrack, where they lived in the horse stalls for the next seven months while they awaited their internment camp to be built in Arkansas. By October of that year, over 18,000 of them were living in Santa Anita. But they had two days to pack. Probably Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday. Soldiers came through and said, We will be picking you up here in two days. You can bring what you can carry in your arms. Upon arriving at Santa Anita, my grandfather, who drove in the caravan then, had to sell his car. It was auctioned at the gate. He got $25 for it. But my grandfather, or my Ojichan is what we call him, my Ojichan, he had a farm. He had a tractor, a truck, equipment, a house, a furnished full house, crops in the field. And during those two days, opportunists cruised through the Japanese farms in the area, paying pennies on the dollar, probably on Good Friday. Many Japanese farmers, of course, took whatever cash they could get. But here's the story I'd never heard before. Then there was Pidoro. Pidoro, a kind farm worker, became a friend of the family. My mom remembers him as a kind man who would, he would sit in the living room and they'd sit on his lap and he would share his tortillas with them. Oh, Pidoro is how my Japanese grandfather would say Pedro. Okay. It was the only way he knew how to say Pedro. But Pidoro was a dear family friend. And my Ojichan, rather than cashing out his farm, he gave it all to Pidoro. It took a while for that to settle in. So my Ojichan's possessions did not go to someone who already had enough. 
someone eager to exploit this poor Japanese farmer. My Ojichan's treasures, all his earthly treasure, went to an industrious, trustworthy Mexican immigrant with a big heart for children, with a hope for building a life in California. When I first heard this story, I really wanted to know what happened to Pedro. Don't you? I'm dying to know. We don't know. But after further reflection, I believe it's better for me not to know. Because the real importance of the story, for me, is not how much my Ojichan helped poor Pedro, but how my Ojichan's act shaped him and my fam his family and my mother and me. My Ojichan could have held out, but he did not hold out for a few more dollars, although he could have rightfully done so. But he surrendered his livelihood and invested it in hope. He saw a different game going on, and he won the better game. He did not see the world as a zero-sum game where Pidoro's gain meant his loss. Pidoro was not the competition. Pidoro was an ally, an ally in the building of America who had an opportunity that was different from my Ojichan's. So my Ojichan surrendered to a good man. Ojichan invested in the future, future which would shape him and eventually me. I'm so happy to know this story. It is a gift of a legacy, and I thank God for it. And Jesus gave himself away. In the face of his enemies, he emptied himself. He humbled himself, refusing to claim his rights. And therefore, God highly exalted him, name above all names. Let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. This mind that is in Christ Jesus on this higher plane. My Ojichan could have bought into the game everyone else was playing. Fight for the best price. Try to win in a demoralizing, dehumanizing, unjust game. There was no winning in this game, really. Whatever the best price might have been, they were still dehumanized in the process. But my Ojichan saw his life on a different plane. He played a different game. He surrendered the few dollars, which is all he would have earned if he'd sold his stuff. He surrendered those few dollars, and in surrendering it, he gave Pidoro's family a new life, an unimaginable precious gift, a new start for a few dollars surrendered. So, this all explains a lot about my mom. Things I never understood. Why she's so generous, and her parents were too. She's always given so much of herself away, selflessly, not worrying about her rights or her profit from the interaction. She's just generous, filled with grace. In the moments of crisis, in the moment of crisis that my Ojichan faced, imagination and discernment were required. And my Ojichan had some imagination. He discerned a better way. Discernment meant not buying into the presenting game the popular activity, and hustling for the best deal. Discernment for him meant seeing reality on a whole other plane. That is what discernment is for us together. Discernment is not 
figuring out how to justify or maximize a plan I've already concocted. That is not discernment. But discernment is paying attention to God's movement and then getting ourselves in line with God's movement. It's about paying attention to God. That's discernment. Jesus discerned the greater good when he went to the cross, humbling himself, not demanding his rights, even as his disciples achingly hoped he would demand his rights. He would not. We have some discerning to do, and we have some disagreements among us. And yet, we are all one body. There is one church. We've always had disagreements among us on some theological issues. We've always had disagreements. And yet, we are all one body. And there is one church from God's perspective. We have disagreements among us about the right denominational home. Some among us are sensing the need or or are convinced of a need to move to a different denomination. And yet we are all one body. There is one church. Friends, our, our ecumenical brothers and sisters in other denominations are not the competition. They are our allies in the building of Christ's kingdom. And they have opportunities different from ours. We may disagree with them about some things. Some of them may even think of us as, as enemies. But fighting head on is not the game that will win. We dearly need imagination to see life on a different plane from God's view. Now, I am not here suggesting any specific solution to any particular situation. But what I am saying is that we need imagination. And we need to take the time to see things from God's perspective. Because the categories that the world presents are not enough to solve our problems. Another potential disagreement that we might run into could be in the light of many new and more and more new exciting forms of ministry percolating among us in our presbytery, aimed at reaching those outside the church. Sometimes when that happens, those of us already inside the church can feel threatened or even resentful of the attention going out there. It's happened in other presbyteries. It happens in other places. But our new ministries are not the competition. They are our allies, our family in the building of Christ's kingdom with people with different opportunities. In fact, the resources that we as a presbytery are preparing for the training of leaders for these new missional communities are in fact resources for all of us. We are committing ourselves to, to the spiritual nurture and missional training of all leaders, all of us, in established churches as well as in new ministries, as well as with our ecumenical partners. We're already cultivating relationships with other denominational partners and leaders. Investing in new works is not something to resent, for it blesses all of us. And to do this, we need, we need to surrender ourselves to this view of one church, that God has one church. In the language of the Fresh Expressions movement that has been shaping our thinking, it's not that there are old churches and then there's cool new churches. There is one church. They don't use old and new language. 
I love the language they use, of the inherited church along with fresh expressions of the church. But there is only one church, and we live together in this one church, this mixed economy, this mixed ecology of the church. Sometimes, in God's view, surrendering our rights, surrendering our self-interest is the way to win. Discerning God's view is the key to our future in God's mission. So paying attention to God's crazy imagination, the imagination that won the ultimate victory by surrendering, paying attention to God's crazy imagination, this is the discernment we need. Holy Spirit, help us to pay attention to your work as we seek to serve you. Help us to work not simply for you as we think, but to do it with you, in line with your heart, your will, your longing for this world that longs for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.